Kate Hardy, one of my colleagues at Imperial College, and I, over a period of about six years, did a series of observations on human embryos. And over six years, we found that each embryo singly transferred to the uterus at the ideal time of the menstrual cycle, which is about timed three days after ovulation should have occurred, each embryo had only an 18% chance of successful implantation. And it turns out that we humans are actually amongst the least fertile animals on the planet. That's an extraordinary thought, considering we're facing a world population explosion. So for example, the average chance of a pregnancy, and I don't suggest you try it, well, you might want to try this this evening. <laughs> <coughs> but if you're not using contraception, the average chance of a pregnancy during a single menstrual cycle in Britain is about 22%. It's um, a bit more in Australia, it's about 24%. Um, and it's thought because they have sex a bit more often. <laughs> and in France, the sexiest nation in the world, it's only 18%. I'm not sure what it is in the United States of America, and really, that doesn't matter this side of the Atlantic. It's really very unimportant. <laughs> but one of the things that we now know is that one of the critical things that happens is that as people age, their fertility gets less, particularly women. Men's fertility is strung out over a longer period of time. But the menopause really occurs around about the age of mid-40s, and after that time, the ovary is virtually completely depleted of eggs, and the chances of getting pregnant at that stage are very small. Around about the age of 42, the average woman will have a chance of getting pregnant each month with regular intercourse of no more between 2 to 3 percent. And it tails off very rapidly after about 35. Now, the interesting question is really what is happening? We know from various observations, Dr. Anderson's work, for example, in Edinburgh, that a little girl shortly after she's conceived in utero has around seven million eggs in total in her ovaries. By the time she's born, there are only two million eggs left. Basically, there's been a process of programmed cell death. We need that because, of course, in utero, we have, we have that with all sorts of tissues. For example, if we didn't, we would have a webbed hand. The web spaces between our fingers disappear with that programmed cell death. And actually, that cell death is occurring in the embryo almost from day one or day two. What we've seen in our laboratory is actually cells dying in an eight-cell embryo. Some of them don't make it, and it's not very clear why that is. It may be due to the body, the embryo, having a mechanism of getting rid of cells which might contribute abnormal cells to the total cell lineage. Whatever the situation, by the time the girl is born, as I say, she has two million eggs, and by the time she reaches puberty, she has about 300 to 400,000 eggs in the ovary. And we've been able to do sophisticated counts in the ovary to demonstrate that that's so in three dimensions across the whole human ovary. Now, of course, as I say, in a matter of 40, 45 years, there will be no eggs left at all in the ovary. So it's not just one loss of an egg each month by ovulation, it's a continual loss of cell death, very rapid indeed. In fact. Any childbearing woman of reasonable age in this audience, by the time we've finished this section of TEBMET, will have lost, on average, two eggs in her ovary. And by comparison, Armand Leroy, sitting over there, will have made about 50,000 new sperm. <laughs> and actually, by tomorrow, he would have made enough sperm to fertilize every single woman in the United Kingdom. <laughs> now, the question really is what we can do scientifically to try to prevent this, and this, I think, is something of really importance. Not that I'm worried about Armand's fertility, 
But I think in our society where we want to see women gaining skills, education, becoming equal of men in the workplace, we have to find ways of trying to do something much more important to ensure that that equality is in biology. And it may well be that there are ways we can hold eggs in arrests in the ovary without them actually being lost by cell death. There's quite a lot of evidence to say that that might be possible. Of course, one way of doing it is by in vitro fertilization. And the man who first did in vitro fertilization, uh, oddly speaking, was over 250 years ago. He was an Italian living in Geneva, a man called Lazaro Spallanzani. And he was really literally the first person to fertilize eggs in an artificial situation. He'd noticed in his pond that the male frogs climbed on the back of the female frogs at this time of the year and was stuck there throughout copulation. It lasted, as you will have seen in your own pond, perhaps if you've got one, up to a week. How marvelous. As far as I know, the only species that does that amongst the mammal is the camel, and the camel can only last for 24 hours. The humans, it's said on average, is about three minutes, but we won't go down that route. <laughs> now, what was interesting about Spallanzana's experiment was he didn't have a microscope, so he couldn't see sperm, which are really tiny. But of course, the eggs in the amphibian are clearly visible to the naked eye. So what he did was, he prized the males off the backs of the females. And I promise you this is literally true because I've read his diary, which is available. He fashioned very tight-fitting taffeta Y-front shorts, and he slipped them on the male frogs, pulling them up round their, whatever, their waist. And then he put them back in the pond on top of the females. They classed the females, and after a few days, the females produced eggs, but none of them produced tadpoles. And then he did what we would now regard as a proof of principle experiment. He took the taffeta shorts off, turned them inside out, scraped the fluid off the inside of the shorts, and inseminated the eggs, and of course got little frogs. Now, it's been a long time since we've actually, actually managed to do in vitro fertilization. Last week, of course, Bob Edwards, the Nobel Prize winner, for being one of the great pioneers in IVF, died. Actually, the first attempts at human in vitro fertilization were about in 1903, and it's probable that various colleagues managed successful fertilization in the 1930s, but there is still considerable argument about that. The interesting point is, though, that even in Britain, where IVF was invented, when you are absolutely clear about the number of cycles done and you look at the official records, you can see that IVF only has a success rate of about 20 to 23 percent per cycle. It's climbing very slowly, but actually three quarters of the time, people don't get pregnant in a single cycle. And that's becoming more important, of course, because now there's greater pressure to transfer only a single embryo because the risk of a multiple birth, twins with subsequent prematurity and possibly death of a child, is an overwhelming issue for our health service. So women are trying all sorts of things to get pregnant by IDF, particularly later in life. For example, in the last 10 years, the official statistics show that double the number of women are now trying to get pregnant after the age of 40 and delivering in some cases. And certainly IVF clinics are really full of people who are in their late 30s and early 40s. And so one of the things that's happening, of course, is that this situation causes undoubted huge desperation amongst women. And sadly, of course, IVF is a massive commercial activity. I regret to say that it's a huge activity commercially in the UK. It's probably even worse in the United States. It is possible, for example, easily in this city of London to pay 7,000 pounds for a single treatment cycle. Actually, I've costed this out, and it should be possible to do in vitro fertilization for no more than 1,500 pounds. But the rewards to the clinician and the team doing it are so immense that massive money is being made. There's a combination, which occurs occasionally in private medicine, and it's worth bearing in mind, of severe desperation on the part of the patient and great avarice 
on the part of the practitioner. And why this is particularly important is that there's now a new field which is coming in, which is egg freezing. Women are coming up to have their eggs frozen in the hope that they can be preserved in liquid nitrogen for long periods of time towards the end of childbearing life. The latest technique is vitrification, where the eggs are plunged into liquid nitrogen very rapidly in a matter of seconds, and no water crystals form inside the cell that avoids crystals bursting the membrane of the cell and causing damage to its architecture. The problem is that when you look at this mathematically, you can see there's a massive problem. An average egg collection will at most, in general, lead to no more than 10 or 12 eggs being collected, of which not all will freeze successfully, and round about of those eggs, 70% will be able to be recovered, but the fertilization rates are not 100%, and indeed the chances of vitrification working are probably less than evens, in any case, well less. For example, one study recently done in the United States shows that on average it takes 15.9 vitrified eggs to achieve one human pregnancy. So this is not a good technology, but in London you can spend several thousand pounds having your eggs stored in liquid nitrogen at a cost of a few pence per litre for the liquid nitrogen per year. Now, many people argue that at a time when there's massive population explosion, we shouldn't be so concerned with fertility anyway. Actually, we may be wrong about that population explosion. We're told again and again from many experts that the world will be well over nine billion people. I remember when I was working as a scientist for WHO in the 1970s, that prediction was not nine or 10 billion, but 110 billion. And so predictions are often very seriously wrong. And in my view, one of the issues here is probably that if we have less conflict, if we have more stability, if we can find ways of dealing with female education and with better hygiene and generally better infrastructure in many societies, that population would diminish, that rising population would diminish as it has done in Europe. The problem we face though, undoubtedly, I think in IVF is yet to come. In my laboratory now, we can transfer genes through the sperm directly into the egg at the time of fertilization, and we can have a very high probability of those genes being incorporated in the genome of a mouse, and soon we will be able to do this with our much bigger animal, the pig. And it turns out to be about 87% success rate at the present time. Moreover, those genes express in a normal sort of way, and the expression is inherited through seven generation, several generations afterwards. Now, if we can make pigs, which might be useful for organ transplantation in the human, which is the goal of this project, why not do modification on the obvious big animal, on the human? And I think the real threat facing us is that people will start to meddle with that genome in the human, and that market and world instability and the general issue with various governments wanting to do things which are not well regulated, may actually cause a real catastrophe for humanity. We think of global warming as being, being the massive problem, but certainly some of the ways we may be pop, uh, uh, altering the world's population in the future are something which we need to think about much more seriously. Genetic manipulation of the human genome is very close to being a human possibility. Thank you.